Historical studies, uh, to repeat once again, present, as Kuhn says, uh, suggest the possibility of a new image of science. So what is this new image of science Kuhn presents in the structure of scientific revolutions? So he presents the development of scientific disciplines. Of course, he himself provides a model, just as Popper, just as logical positivists did. But he claims this model is far better rooted in the actual practice and history of science than previous models. Huh? So anyway, it's a, 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 another way of understanding the nature of science. So what is this model? Kuhn says any scientific discipline starts off as um, uh, a, um, with a what he calls a, a pre-scientific period or pre-normal uh, science. So there, there, are, there are schools of thought, as he says, which actually do not really talk to one another. Think of, for example, ancient Greece and the various theories uh, offered by uh, philosophers, beginning with pre-Socratics, about the world. Each one had its own, his own point of view. They were not really talking to one another. Simply, each theory was uh, carried on or uh, transferred from master to pupil uh, from time, from generation to generation. We have different theories or different uh, pictures of the world um, that develop, uh, develop independently from one another. This is a, a pre-paradigmatic, pre-scientific, pre-normal -norm periods of science. As Kuhn says. At some point, and this is true for any scientific discipline, at some point, for some reasons, and Kuhn is not very uh, rigor, well, well, very precise about it. So he says, at some point, we see that these schools fade away and only one of them remains. What happens? Possibly one, uh, as time passes, and problems uh, uh, take different forms, uh, only one of them is able to cope with these problems, to account for, the, for these problems, or else uh, only one of these point of view is actually, actually manages to uh, present a, a prediction or to offer a prediction that actually uh, turns out to be true or turns out to be confirmed uh, by evidence or or uh, a prediction that is particularly successful uh, and therefore leads to the affirmation of that specific school, that specific uh, point of view or viewpoint in the, uh, in the science. So the other schools fade away, uh, in fact, disappear, and the, that scientific discipline uh, enters what Kuhn calls a mature state, a mature uh, phase of its development. And this is actually uh, the moment at which normal science begins. So normal science is science practice uh, under the guide of a specific set of uh, theories, methods, empirical results, and so on. And this constellation, as Kuhn says, of methods, theories, uh, corollaries, uh, um, auxiliary hypotheses, experimental results, uh, depending on the on the on the uh, on the discipline specimen, possibly, and so on. This is what Kuhn calls a paradigm. Paradigm is a world of a word that comes from if you study. Uh, classical sciences, uh, so a paradigm of any uh, verb in Latin or in Greek is the model. Uh, you memorize a model for that verb, uh, including a number of his uh, forms. And by memorizing the, that model, you are able to form any tense uh, of that specific verb. So it's a, basically a model for on which to practice a language um, on which to, uh, by which we can speak a language. Uh, so the, that's the idea. 
a paradigm in Kuhn sense is a constellation again of methods, practices, theories, uh, experimental results, data, tables, for example, numerical or astronomical tables, uh, the time of Galileo and Copernicus and Kepler and so on, that form the uh, model for all the science that is being practiced under that paradigm. So a scientific community is a group of people, no matter how large, a group of people that works within uh, a given paradigm, within that theoretical framework. Um, and conversely, a paradigm is the model that is used from time to time uh, in the, these periods of normal science by a given uh, scientific community. Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of circular definition of scientific community and paradigm, but it's not a vicious circle. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, there are periods in which a given theoretical framework is used and never actually discussed, never actually, uh, there's, there are no attempts to refute, as Popper would say, this uh, framework. Take, for example, and this is a classic example uh, Kuhn himself does in the structure of scientific revolution, of uh, Ptolemaic astronomy. Ptolemaic astronomy was a paradigm for the discipline of astronomy offered by Ptolemy in the second century AD, uh, co uh, codified, so to say, in Popper, is, oh, sorry, in Ptolemy's uh, book, the Almagest. And this was actually the model codified by that textbook, so to say, uh, for all subsequent astronomy, all subsequent practice in astronomy from the second century AD up until, let's say, the end of the uh, scientific revolution in the 17th, in the 17th century, 1687, uh, with the uh, publication of the first edition of Newton's Cranky. In fact, Copernicus himself, uh, the very starter of the Copernican revolution, actually employed, used Ptolemy's astronomy. So in, in, in Copernicus' own revolutionary work, uh, De Revolutionibus, uh, as a very recent edition of this work actually showed, Copernicus was actually incorporating parts, huge chunks of Ptolemy's Almagest in the, the Revolutionibus, even though he was moving away from that uh, kind of picture. Uh, still, he used very much, uh, actually translated, not himself through the help of a, of a pupil of his, Reticus, he translated from, uh, from Ptolemy's Greek uh, uh, Almagest. The Almagest was originally written in Greek because Ptolemy was from uh, Alexandria. And, um, and uh, he actually translated that into Latin and incorporated big chunks of the original Almagest into the De Revolutionis. So it took, so uh, this is significant because even the start of the, of the Copernican revolution uh, could not do completely without Ptolemy. Right? So Ptolemy was the model and his book, the Almagest was the textbook for the paradigm of astronomy for centuries, from the second century AD up until the 16th century, more than a millennium. So this is just an example, a very famous and, uh, and, uh, and uh, discussed example of, of normal science that lasted for several centuries. What happens during these periods of normal science? Uh, during these periods, it's not actually, uh, as I said, the paradigm is never questioned. Uh, so what happens when there is a problem, something that appears not to be fitting, not to fit with the categories of the paradigm? Well, uh, how do scientists deal with these problems? 
Well, first of all, it is important to notice that uh, Kuhn does not use the term problem. So as I said, there are a number of key terms introduced by Kuhn in the structure of scientific revolutions. Uh, one is normal science, one is, of course, a scientific revolution. Uh, another is incommensurability, we shall come back to that uh, in a while. Uh, but another one uh, is uh, puzzle. Kuhn does not use the word problem, instead he uses the word puzzle. Puzzle is a game, as you know. Uh, and why does Kuhn use appeals to this, to this term? Why does he employ this term? Because he says, when we have a puzzle that is a, an image basically, broken into hundreds of thousand pieces, and the task of the game, uh, the idea of the game that is that we put all these pieces back together to form the image that is usually reproduced on the box or somewhere else in the game. So we will never start putting all these pieces together if we were not sure from the very beginning that they could be placed one next to the other. They, they could be, um, they could fit together and in one way and form the broader picture. We would never start playing the game if we were not sure from the very beginning that the solution exists. And that is exactly why Kuhn is, uh, Kuhn chooses to use the term puzzle instead of problem. A problem is something that uh, we face and we actually do not know whether a solution exists. We do not know where to look for a solution, or maybe we have some idea, but we can, we can never be certain. Take, for example, um, a work I've been working, sorry, um, for, uh, for a number of years now, namely a small book by Kepler. Kepler, in 1611, published a small book uh, titled Strena Seu Denives Examen, uh, that is on the six-cornered snowflake. Kepler asks why, it looks like a trivial uh, question, but uh, Kepler was much intrigued by that. Why are snowflakes or snow crystals always six cornered, not five cornered at times, or seven cornered, or three cornered, and so on? Indeed, the reason, why, uh, the reason Kepler worked on that was because six was, uh, seems to be a recurrent number in nature. Six was the number of planets known at the time, and Kepler strove to come up, which he did in the Mysterium Cosmographicum in 1596, uh, with the reason why there are only six, and no more than six, or no less than six planets in our universe. That's what he thought, that the universe was basically our solar system at the time. But anyway, and not, not even the solar system we know nowadays, was a, uh, made of only of six planets. But anyway, uh, that was the knowledge at the time. And Kepler said, there are only six planets. Why six? Why did God create only six planets? And he came up with this uh, idea of uh, uh, connecting the planets to the five platonic solids and so on and so forth. I'm not going into this. But anyway, so he was intrigued by this recurrence of number six in nature. And so he focused on this apparently trivial problem. Why are snow crystals always six cornered? And it's interesting, uh, this is a problem in the true uh, meaning of the term. So Pop, um, sorry. Kepler did not have a solution to this problem, did not have an answer to the question, why are snow crystals often, always six cornered? And indeed, in this small booklet, which he published in 1611, uh, he, it's a small, it's a 20 page uh, book, beautiful book. Um, he presents a number of possible answers to these questions. And it's a very Popperian book, so to say, if I may say, because it presents a number of um, possible answers to these questions. Why are snow crystals always six cornered, and then refute them. 
So he publishes a book without asking a question at the beginning and then not providing an answer, which is quite uh, unusual, I would say. Nowadays, we publish a book when we have a problem at the beginning and then we come up maybe after years of research with a solution and then we decide to make this solution public. Let others know about our achievements, so to say. Uh, Kepler thought that it was important not only to provide uh, results or positive answers to a, question, to a given question, but also, such as in the case of uh, Six Corner Snowflake, 1611, to show his fellow scientists the different paths he walked in order to answer the question, even if he failed. He wanted to show his fellow scientists uh, all the attempts he did. And then all the attempts that actually eventually failed. Uh, but in order to tell them, look, I've always, I've already looked into this direction, into that direction, in this other direction, and I couldn't come up with an answer. So indeed, we, if we have to, if we ever manage to answer this question, why are Six, as no crystals always six cornered, we have to look somewhere else. And in fact, indeed, in the uh, on the very last page of the book, he says we have to knock on the door of uh, chemists and alchemists. At the time, alchemists were were basically chemists, uh, so they were doing science uh, as understood at the time. Um, we have to know, knock on the door of chemists and alchemists and ask them to tell us something more about the inner structure of, nature, of uh, matter uh, for us to be able to answer the questions, why are no crystals all, always six core? And as uh, it often happened in, with, uh, with Kepler was a tremendous genius, uh, whatever he touched actually, he turned into gold, um, and uh, indeed he was right once again. Indeed, the reason, as you know very well, much better than I do, the reason why snow crystals are, um, are, are six cornered very much depends on the structure of the molecule of water. But of course, at the time of Kepler, uh, there was no knowledge about molecules or uh, uh, distributions of atoms uh, inside the molecule and so on. By the way, Kepler was not an atomist and his, uh, the book actually starts with a pol polemic uh, or, or with his uh, patron back and from back and tells, uh, about atomism. Uh, you know, I'll just tell you this because it's really beautiful. Then I'll go back to my to my to the topic of my uh, lecture today. Uh, but he starts off his book by saying, um, the book is titled Strena, uh, that is a New Year's gift. So he's he's uh, saying, I'm coming to to your house. Uh, the uh, Bakker von Bakkerfels was a was a um, a high member of the hierarchy around the, 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 the uh, emperor, uh, Rudolf II in Prague. So I'm coming to your house because you invited me for the festivities of the new, of the new year and I'm ashamed of, of myself because I don't have any, uh, any gift to, to, to bring to you. And so what can I bring, he says, to a lover of nothing. He, he refers to his patron as a lover of nothing because Bakker von Bakkenfels, his patron, was actually a supporter of atomism. But uh, Kepler was no atomist and he calls atoms nothing. So he claims that the atoms did not exist. And then he says, with a beautiful sentence, uh, so I could bring you uh, this, uh, the Democritus atoms, but they are really nothing. I could bring, uh, bring you dust, that's really too little. I could bring this and that. But then he says, then I'm crossing the bridge, which is the Charles Bridge in Prague, because Kepler was living in the center of the town while, while 
our backer von Wackenfels uh, lived very close uh, to the to the castle of Prague. So I'm crossing the Charles Bridge and it starts snowing. And so these little starlets of ice, it says, fall of my on my coat, and I see that there are six corners. So here's the, the best gift for my patron, who is a lover of nothing. In fact, uh, they come from the sky, and I am a, a, an astronomer. They have an hexagonal symmetry, and I am a mathematician. And then if you ask a German what snow means, he will reply nothing. Uh, snow, he, uh, Kepler was writing in, in Latin, and so snow in Latin is nix, which sounds exactly n i x, which sounds exactly as nix, the German word for nothing. So it's a very um, nice wordplay with this uh, with this idea. Anyway, just uh, sorry, I love this word so much that I couldn't refrain from mentioning it. So in the case of Kepler, to go back to my to my talk. In the case of Kepler, he was really facing a problem. He did not uh, know any solution. In fact, he came up with publishing a book without offering a positive solution to the, to the original question. So uh, this appears to be a problem, one of many problems scientists face in their everyday practice. Kuhn has a different point of view. He says, uh, whenever a scientist enters his laboratory, he does not challenge the theory he's been trained in or he's upholding or the scientific community is a member of is upholding. Why? Because if he faces any problem, let's use this word uh, for the time being, if he faces any problem, he thinks it's his fault, not the theory's fault for the problem. So the reasons for that problem, behind that problem, is that his, the scientist's inability to, uh, so to say, connect that specific issue with the categories of the paradigm. So whenever a scientist faces a problem, he says, well, we have to work on it and find a solution, but the solution exists. Who says so? Who says that the solution exists? The paradigm. The paradigm assures us that a solution exists. It's only the task of the researcher or the scientists to solve, so to say, this problem by um, referring it back to the categories of the paradigm. And the, since we are assured, even before we spot a problem, since we are assured of the existence of a solution, then he says we should not really refer to that problem as a problem, but as a puzzle. Right? Because just like in the case of a uh, of the of the game, well, I guess we all played puzzle at some point of our lives. Uh, we are assured of the existence of a solution, and that's a very uh, a very, uh, how can I say, uh, revolutionary way of looking at things. <music>